Hello everyone, welcome to Cities in Cinema. I'm Chin Anju, the second year PhD student in Geography from the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. And the movie we are going to talk about today is The Echoes of the Rainbow. Directed by Alex Lawn in 2010, this movie talks about the ups and downs of the life from a family only a shoe store in the 60s Hong Kong, as seen through the eyes of a child. The movie is adapted from the director's real-life story, and the eight-year-old boy you see in the movie is actually based on the director's childhood. In this presentation, we have three sections. In the first section, we are going to talk about the history of Hong Kong with the focus on the 1960s Hong Kong. In the second part, we are going to discuss some life values and emotions from this movie. And in the last part, we are going to pick up some representative culture symbols shown in this movie, and we will have more discussion based on each of these symbols. Before we dig into the history of Hong Kong, let's look at the Hong Kong's geography first. Hong Kong is located on the south coast of China and has a total area of 430 square mile. Hong Kong in administration consists of 18 districts from three different regions. And these three different regions are Hong Kong Island, Kulon, and the new territories. You can find the details about the divisions on the map um, on the right. Although well known as a metropol metro metropolis, only 25% of Hong Kong's land has been developed. And around 42% of the land is actually country park and the natural preserves. The climate in Hong Kong is subtropical, tending towards temperate for nearly half the year. May to November are the months during which tropical cyclones of different intensity may strike Hong Kong, especially the July to September are the most likely months that the tropical cyclones will affect Hong Kong. But if we look at these two figures, we can actually see the December and the during the December and uh, um, November, we can we actually have some good weather. We have plenty of sunshine. We have comfortable temperature. So it could be a good time for your vacation in Hong Kong. Tier 2022, the Hong Kong population is around 7.5 million, which ranks number 104 in the list of countries by the population. If we look at the map below, we will find, find out that the majority of Hong Kong's population only distributes in few districts in Hong Kong's island and the Kulong. But at the same time, the Hong Kong currently has one of the lowest birth rate in the world. And the story behind this is rather complex. So the modern day Hong Kong is best known for its skyscrapers and the role as a bustling financial hub and regional tra trading center. But back to 70 and 80 years ago, this territory was basically um, was a quite black water of rural hamlets and fishing comedies. So when we look at the history of Hong Kong, an important question is that what is the key turning point in Hong Kong's evolutions from a village center to the metropolis that everyone now knows today? And the answer is 1960s. Because 1960s is the defining decade in the formation of Hong Kong identity as it is today. 
And also remember that 1960s is also the story of the echo of the rainbow happened. So now let's take a brief look at why 1960s was so important in Hong Kong's history and its evolution. Of course, the first one is the economy. As you can see from here, the 1960s is actually the starting point of the economic growth in Hong Kong. The industrialization of Hong Kong can actually be dated back to the embargoes in the 1950s. After five, around 10 years during the 1960s, Hong Kong underwent a rapid and successful processes of industrialization, which led to the blooming economy. And the economic development of Hong Kong during this period is unusual in a variety of respects. Some main contributions of such um, fast development include low taxes, the lax employment laws, the absence of government debt, and the free trade. As the more rapid growth of the GDP you see here after the 1970s, it's mainly because of the re integration of Hong Kong with the mainland China, which also opened another era for Hong in Hong Kong's economy. It's important to notice that Hong Kong was once a British colony for over 150 years, of course, including the 1960s we are talking about now. I think when we look at when we look back at this story, informed and balanced assessment to the legacy of British administration in Hong Kong are needed because British can actually claim considerable credit for the success of Hong Kong today. For example, the most significant British contribution to Hong Kong's success has been its promotion of economic freedom with limited government. In the post-war era, the British colonial officials have suggested the positive non-interventionism as their guiding light in the economic policy in Hong Kong. And during also during this time period, the colonial, the Chinese, and the lo local culture seem to coexist peacefully in Hong Kong for a quite long time. Even to today, the British colonial influences can still exist in Hong Kong, and you can easily find them. A good example is the Hong Kong milk tea, which is one of the most famous Hong Kong food. But this special milk tea is actually um, based on the British milk tea, and then later was adapted um, from the local taste. Also, the transportation during the 60s in Hong Kong was changing. The man-powered transport quickly became a thing of the past, and when the street were like taken over by the model vehicles in this era, and the public transportation transport was provided by buses and the trams. And here are two pictures from the night uh, 60s Hong Kong. One of is the bus. And this one is actually the traditional like main part of transport. From the perspective of the cultural, people of Hong Kong in 60s began to experience a lifestyle that in both material and spiritual terms was becoming increasingly sophisticated. And one of the good examples is the influence of the Western culture. For example, at that time, the miniskirts, the bell-bottom trousers, and the platform shoes are the typical icons of 60s fashion in Hong Kong. And here we also have the Beatles in Hong Kong and the Hollywood theater at the same year. But at the same time, the traditional form of entertainment, such as the street performance or the street comic stores, 
remained hugely popular. So in general, the culture become more like mixed with the Western culture and the traditional like way of entertainment. And of course, the most important one is the population growth. Hong Kong's population surged from 3 million in 1960 to 5 million in the 1979. So basically there was a 2 million population growth only between two, uh, twenty only between twenty years, and this rapid growth in the population exerted a huge pressure on Hong Kong's healthcare, housing, and the education systems. So, if you remember, there is one line in the movie saying that Hong Kong is so chaotic now; those who can are all living. So besides the blooming economy, the improved transportation, the more diverse culture, what made the 60s Hong Kong chaotic at that time that those who can are all living? And of course, this has something to do with the population explosion. And one of the most important problem is the social inequality. And I think, I believe, if you watch the movie, it's very easy for you to pick up some very straightforward things or the details that show the social inequality at that time, especially the wealth gaps. But here I want to like discuss another very fascinating examples that can help us to understand or look at the social inequality at that time in Hong Kong. And this example is the Kulong Wat city, so-called the city of the darkness. The Kulong Wat city once considered as the dentist settlement on the earth. Instead of calling it a city, it's basically a slum, but a slum without any government enforcement. So the story behind this is quite complex and it can trace back to the Qing um, like the hundreds of years ago. But during the 1950s to 1970s, a large number of immigrants poured into Hong Kong from the southern China and settled down in this what city. And especially in the 60s, the city also underwent massive construction so basically what um what did the people did at that time is that they simply add more like mod module uh on the top of the existing building. So they simply like build up floors, pine up floors, and eventually like if for the like you can see the shape is like a ward, and that is the why it got its name. And more importantly, this slum has a very famous population for its high rates of prostitution, like or the drug abuse and the gambling, also the dentists without license. And here are some more pictures inside the war cities. So as you can see, it'll be really hard for us to imagine how can a person live in such like dense, depressing, but also kind of dirty environment. At the same time, you can like Google the pictures around the Victoria Harbor at the same time, in the same time period. And it can really help you to visually see how the social inequality at that time period and uh, how people from different classes have a totally different life. Oh, and by the way, the this slum was eventually demolished in 1993. And uh, now 
in Hong Kong, this area is um, actually a wetland park. And then another thing contributed to the chaos, chaos of the Hong Kong in the 60s is the police corruptions. Um, from the movie, you can see actually the shop and the store owners, they have to pay so-called protection fees to the local police. If you don't pay for that, they will simply kick you out, like here in the movie. If you are saying no, I will tell the super and someone will help you to move out tomorrow. So it's something like you have to pay, right? You got no choice. And on the right side, this is actually uh, also a very famous movie called Lee Rock in 1991. It's a movie about how a poor but clean police officer became the most notorious but also powerful detective to, through the police corruption. And it's also based on the real police detective in Hong Kong's history in the 60s. And because due to the widespread corrupt police corruptions, the Independent Commission Against uh, Corruption, the ICAC, was established in 1974 in Hong Kong, which has been quite effective at eradicating the widespread corruption in, in the city. As we uh, talked about the before the climate in Hong Kong, the summer is actually the time that the tropical cyclones of different intensity may strike the Hong Kong. And exactly, um, during the 1960s, there are three extremely damaging tropical um, cyclones that stalk the Hong Kong. And this is also something um, reflect, reflecting in the movie. And the last one is there was an anti-British administration riot in the late 1960s, which also led to a huge emigration wave in Hong Kong. So based on what we have discussed so far, I think it's reasonable to assume that the 1960s in Hong Kong was a exciting era with all kinds of opportunity brought by the blooming economy. But at the same time, it was also quite chaotic due to the many social problems and the natural disasters. So I think um, for a normal family, especially like a family from the working class, um, what they were facing with every day in Hong Kong at that time was more likely to be challenges and the difficulties instead of the excitement or like opportunities, right? And therefore, in this case, the people's life values will become way more important because life val when the life is hard, your life values could be some very powerful tools to help you to go through the difficulties or can help you to stand up again after so many failures. And this is um, another take home message from this movie. That is, we need to have like values in our life in this movie, especially the faith. And the reason we have like a, this section is to show us that a story in a movie has to like ha like a story from a movie needs to have a background like when well who right but the values or the emotions from the movie a movie trying to convey can actually go beyond the historical context can go beyond the city go beyond the people right and he in the movie there are so many interesting details that uh, relate to the people's values and their emotions 
And sometimes they are quite confusing if you don't understand the background behind them. And so I just pick up um, two examples to discuss here. Um, first, one example is actually uh, based on the shoes. So if you remember um, the low couple in the movie, they actually had a little conversation when they look, looked at the sign of the shoe uh, in front of their store, right? And the Mr. Law simply said half of the shoe is hard, but Mrs. Law replied to him, but you still have, have an other side, which was good. So you may not quite understand what's going on here, but actually this has something to do with the Chinese characters. So I list three Chinese characters here. The top one here means shoes in uh, English as the same you can see here and here. Um, and the bottom left one means hard and difficult in English. And the bottom right one means good or desired in general. So if we just look at the right side of the shoes, which I marked in blue, you will find out it's really similar to the right, to the uh, left side of the heart. But if we look at the right side of the shoes, the Chinese character, it just look like the same for the uh, the same to the right side of the good and that is um the well the uh you have one one side of the shoes is hard but you still have another one which is good and i'm picking this example to actually to show you how life values can inspire people to view their surroundings Life is just like shoes. You cannot separate them, right? You cannot separate the good and the bad, but it depends on you to choose which side you want to believe. You can see, well, life is hard, but you can also see the bright side. We still have another uh, good half. And this is not only um, about Chinese language, because I also find another very interesting interpretation about th this in English, that is half of the shoe stands for war, hard times, but the another half stands for the shine, good times. And the second example I want to talk about is actually the low couple in this movie, because they are a very typical example of how Chinese traditional Chinese parents look like. So if you remember, the Mr. Law was always the like strict father figure in the movie. He scouted and even threw the chopstick to his son's face because two are uh, um two grades of his um son were not like that great. And when he find out his little son stole things from different places, he just beat his son. But by contrast, the Mrs. Lohan was more like a caring, gentle mother. She is always like trying to stop his husband's anger. And so this is a very, like I said, a very typical like um, family pattern in Hong Kong or like broadly in China. And many people nowadays are criticizing the, this kind of like family pattern. And of course, you can think about the advantages or the disadvantages of such family pattern for a child. But um, more broadly, I think we can like think about whether this, like, is there any something from the low couple that you you are familiar with is there any something from them that can resonate with you or is there um do you know any someone like you one of your friends their family just like act like the same like the uh, the low couple here and how 
actual in in the reality how does he or her deal with such like family relationship so um a more important um thing here is that we need to like think beyond the context of the movie and sometimes we may have some like very interesting findings I believe there are still many like touching moments or the emotions from this movie, but we we are, like we we cannot like go through each one here. But um, I want to like point out using um the using a citation from the producer of this movie that is, there are some relationship and emotions that can transcend boundaries, countries, and language. This can actually help us to think what is a good movie. A good movie must be a good story. After like 10 years, 20 years, when you like look back, when you look back at this movie, probably you've already forget the like the visual effect of this movie. But I think if it's a good movie, then the life values or the emotions from it, you can it's something that you can still easily recall. So in the last part, let's look at some interesting cultural symbols shown in these movies. Here are just some clues and we will go through each one later. So the first symbol is the mooncakes. And the move cakes are frequently mentioned and shown in this movie. Um, move cake is a very um, important tradition in Mid-Autumn Festival. And the Mid-Autumn Festival is one of the most important festivals in Hong Kong and China, in addition to the most well-known Lunar New Year. Um, this Mid-Autumn mid um, festival is, is actually to celebrate the harvest and the reunion of the family members. So to some extent, it's kind of like the Thanksgiving here. But um, the date of the Mid-Autumn Festival is kind of hard and complex to calculate. But usually it's between the mid or the late of the September. Of the September. And uh, people in China, they believe that this date, the Mid-Autumn Festival, is the best date for them to enjoy the full move from the sky. That is the roundest move. And in Chinese culture, the roundness symbolizes the completeness and the togetherness. And a full moon symbolizes the reunion of the whole family members. And if you notice that actually the shape or the design of the move cake then symbolize the full moon. And this is the like the connections between the runness, between the move, between the move cakes. And in addition to the move cakes, another important uh, festival tradition is watching the lanterns. Each year during the Mid-Autumn Festival in Hong Kong, there will be a very spectacular like lantern show. So, um, Hong Kong people actually has a very, very long history of the obsession of the Mid-Autumn Festival and the move cake. And a great um, evidence is the move cake plan mentioned in this movie. It's quite um, confusing if you don't know what it is, what this is about. So, as I um, mentioned before, like in the mid-autumn festivals, each family will eat move cakes, but most of the time they also send the move cake to the people they know, like family members, like your boss, or like the your advisor, or like the police officer in the movie, right? So usually they need more than one boxes of the move cakes. Sometimes it could be more than 10, 10 boxes. But back to 90s, the 
uh, 60s, the 1960s, Moof cake is not something that you can easily buy or easily easily afford. Um, for the normal family or the family from working class, it was kind of difficult for them to pay like ten boxes of the Moof cake at one time, and therefore the Moof cake factories then allowed the customers to pre-order the Moof cake via the monthly instrument so they can get enough move cake needed before the festival. And this is one of the earliest forms of the instrument in Hong Kong's e economy. So it's kind of interesting to think about it. Nowadays, we use monthly instrument to pay car or the house, but back to 60s, the Hong Kong people, they, they actually use the monthly instrument to pay the move cake, which is another, which actually you can see how they valued the move cake and the mid-autumn festivals. And this picture on the right are simply some like receipt or the contract you can get after you sign up a move cake plan. And this number here are the amounts from the January to the December, and this is what you need to pay each month, the monthly payment. And this is something related to the, how many boxes of move cake you can get and what their tastes. But nowadays, um, you can easily buy the traditional move cake online. They're not, and they're not the luxury of things anymore. But um, people still trying to use more like creative and the or like more expensive ingredients to make the creative move cake. Like here, like nowadays we have the move cake made by the caviar. So um, the second exam, the cultural symbol I want to discuss is actually the Hong Kong cinema in 1960s. So The Echo of the Rainbow is a movie in 2010 talking the talking about the story in 60s. And in the movies, um, in order to get a full box of the move cakes so he can eat all of them up by himself, the little son, the little brother, um, started to sell the picture of the movie star at that time and uh, uh, when he was selling the pictures he mentioned some names of the movie stars at that time and I took a screenshot here like Connie Chen, Josephine Sell, Babo Fong. So if you don't know the like the background here you will simply skip these names but the this uh, like movie star here was so iconic at that time period. And of course, they then they became very important cultural symbols. So another interesting question here we can look at is that what did this movie stars and their work in 60s look like? And how did they reflect the culture and the society at that time? And um a back story here is that during the um, 1960s, uh, um, many like new generation in Hong Kong, they are trying, they were trying to find their new identity in this city. They were trying to claim they are part of the city, right? Because their most of the, their parents are the immigrants from the mainland China, but this new generation, they were really um, eager to claim the city as their home. And as a result, the movie in Hong Kong at that time turned to this young generation. And uh, um, some common theme included the generation conflicts or the young's problems or their new identification as the generation as a new generation. And here is the most iconic 
um, Coney Chen. And um, at first look, there are so many reasons why she was so iconic and could be um, an icon in the 1960s. So at first, the Connie Chen represents Hong Kong cinemas as a whole simply because she was one of the best known celebrities of the decades. Further exposing trends, styles, social taste regarding the entertainment, fashion, or in Western pop culture. But in in deeper level, the iconic um, interpretation refers to the emerging culture of factory girls, which Coney Chen will represent in many of her movies. And she expresses that um, a sense of new confidence from the city, mainly because of the economic takeoff and the rising standards of the living. So it's more like about the bright side of the society, right? Like the new confidence of the new Hong Kong people. But at the same time, so, um, this is another different example. It's a movie called Teddy Girls in uh, 1969. Um, it's a movie about the uh, Josephine Cell, which is the second name mentioned here. So this movie was different. It was also quite entertaining, but um, at the same time, the movie was trying to pass along a social message of how a bad environment can produce a bad child. So as you can see, the character, the, uh, the Josephine Plain is an uh, angry teenager girl. And the name Teddy Girls is actually derived from the Teddy Boys, a 1950s British term to describe a subculture of the rebellious like young men. So if you are interested in, you can like find this movie online. They're pretty old, but they are like quite interesting. And the last symbol I want to talk about is the housing architecture at that time, because housing architecture is something that can affect people's living habits and the their neighborhood with the people surrounding. And in the movie, we can actually see how people had dinner at that time. And basically what they did is they will like bring their dining tables, chairs, and dishes, and they sat close to each other. They shared their dishes with each other. And this like close neighborhood relationship is actually a very important component in the collective memories of 60s in that generation. And definitely housing architecture has, has some uh, contribute to this like neighborhood relationship to some extent, right? Because if we look at this picture, um, those buildings are not really high, right? But uh, they are basically, they're, they are just like three to four floor. And uh, you can imagine that the living space inside the building is also kind of narrow and each building cannot support too many like families. So in this case, the public space, the street, became more important. And, uh, you know, because the living space inside the um, home is narrow. So sometimes people tend to come out from their home and meet with each other, bond with each other. So sometimes they feel like they we are living on the street instead of like, instead of like now we feel like, oh, we are living inside a building, inside a like apartment, right? And because of this close relationship, like people always have a feeling, people at that time always had a feeling that a near neighbor is better than a distant cousin. Then I have to mention the filming location, the Winley Street in Hong Kong. Um, 
see um this is a screenshot from the movie and this is the real photo uh of the Wenli Street. They are like basically identical. And here's are some interesting story behind the Wenli Street and the movie of Echoes of the Rainbows. Because according to the director, at the first he thought it was impossible to find any street in Hong Kong now that can resemble the street in his uh, street in 60s, like in his memory. But one day when he read the newspaper, he saw that the Wenli Street was going to demolished by the urban renewal program. And suddenly he feel like, well, this is the street in my memory from the 60s. And they decided to actually film this movie on the Willie Street. And till today, you can still visit this street in Hong Kong. And it's one of the last streets in Hong Kong with a cluster of Chinese-style tenement building kept intact. Um, it's because of the success of this movie and uh, the director and the audience, they really want to like keep this place as a memory, as a city memory. Therefore, 11 buildings um, built in the early 1950s have been saved from the wrecking balls. And that is the reason we can still visit this street nowadays in Hong Kong. And I think this is also a very good example to show that a store, a movie could be a cultural heritage for a city. It helped us to see the treasure, the historical treasure we have to protect inside a city. Because without this movie, the Wellington Street won't be exist anymore. And here are just some extensions. Um, after 10 years, like in around 1970s, due to the explosion of the population, of course, those traditional Chinese tenement buildings were not functional anymore. And the government have to build more like public housing estates. And the housing buildings at that time, like just look like this. So we can see um, the buildings are actually much higher, but not that high, right? And it got denser. But still, for people who had lived in this like public housing, they still have a very good memory with their like neighborhoods. And building designs of this kind of public housing has something to do with this relationship. And these are some like interesting facts. Um, inside each of this building, there is only one kitchen and a bathroom each floor. So you can imagine that people still like frequently met each other, right? Especially like in the lunchtime or the dinner time, well, they will like, cook together and one of the most funny memory from that generation is that they stole the food from their neighbors when they neighbors made some like yummy dishes and then another thing another interesting thing is that of course there there wasn't any like air conditioners inside this uh, buildings and uh, like we mentioned before the summer in Hong Kong could be pretty hot and humid so after like the dinner people will still like come out grab their chairs like sat um, together chatting and for children they just like planning and the street um, is still their planning ground but even if for the like public housing like this was a very, very long history. And this is what we actually have in Hong Kong nowadays. Those skyscraper um, apartment complex, which is significantly changed people's like emotions and their like lifestyles, right? Because nowadays everyone is busy and especially when we lived inside this like 
like complex, we probably are not able to see our neighbors every day. We or even never talked to our neighbors. We will never know their like first name of your neighbors. And this is not only the problem about Hong Kong. And you can find, uh, but because Hong Kong has the least affordable housing market, this is like more serious in Hong Kong. And uh, um, there is one district um, district in Hong Kong called Ting Sui Wai. And this it would be a great example to show how like the this kind of um, public housing affect people's life. Ting Sui Wai was called the city of Stannis in Hong Kong. And here's uh, some like brief background of the Ting Sui Wai and why it was called the city of the Stannis. The government built many public housing estates in 1990s in Ting Sui Wai. And a lot of the residents are from the low income low income class who cannot afford the um private housing and of at the same time many like immigrants from the mainland china they also like moved into the this place and uh, of course those people are usually unemployed and they couldn't get used to the busy modern life in hong kong so um, situated away from the central area and without jobs, activities, services, Ting Sui Wai quickly became to a like textbook example of a bad urban planning from the worst day of the modernism. And especially by the early of um, 2000s, Hong, Hong Kong people had like faced a series of like the suicide or like family tragedies in the Ting Sui Wai. Um, so because of this problem, many nowadays, many Hong Kong movie, they start to focus on the normal people, especially people like this, people with um, disabled people or like um, children from divorced family or the immigrants, the new immigrants from the mainland China or other like Asian countries. And at the same time, the directors of this movie try to like tell people like under such like pressure or like difficulty, those group of people still help each other. They still have their own life values. They still have faith. But at the same time, the like the society must have to deal with those problems because like they really make people's life like tough. And um, here is the all three sections of the presentation. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I want to use um, one line from this movie to end. That is, and, and in the end, the greatest thief of all is time. When you think about yourself, think about you from like 10 years ago, what do you think the time has stolen from you? And when you think about you from like 20 or 30 years after after 20 or 30 years, what do you think the time may steal from you? And what is the what is the thing that you most cherish that you don't want the time to still uh, with you still from you and i hope you can enjoy this movie and thanks for listening to this lecture